Uh, if you have your Bibles, go with me to John 3. John 3, very familiar passage of Scripture this morning. If you don't have your Bibles, go to your phones. Most of us use our phones in this, this day and age. But we're continuing in the four themes of Advent, those things being hope, peace, love, and joy. And so far we've talked about two of those. Uh, we've talked about hope and how we can have hope in the midst of what seems like hopeless situations because of the eternal hope that we have through Christ. We've also talked about peace and how we can have peace or how we have access to peace, not peace as the world gives. Scripture says, I give, or Christ says, I give you peace. This is a peace that passes all understanding that guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This morning, our assignment is love. And I submit to you, family, that I've never felt more unqualified to stand before you than I do on this morning. You see, the word love has been so overused in our society that I feel its meaning has been weakened. We love love. We love to talk about the things that we love. We sing about love. It's a word that has become so common that it's not just people who use it sparingly. Corporations even use it. Who can finish this jingle? Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. I'm loving it, right? McDonald's. Chevrolet even got in on the game. Very great commercial. Maybe you've seen it. The wife comes in and sets two watches on the counter in front of her husband, and she says, I did some early shopping, one for you, one for me. And he gets up all excited, you know, great, babe, thanks. I did some early shopping too. And he takes her to the front door, revealing this beautiful brand new red SUV and this great, amazing four-door truck. And he points to the SUV and he says, one for you. And he points to the truck and says, one for me. And as he's saying this, she runs over to the truck and says, I love it. And he, he, he tries to explain, no, the SUV is for you. The truck is, and she's like, no, I love it. As to say, it's, it's mine. For many of us, the word love has been so tied to a feeling or an emotion or a thing. It's something that's, that's tangible but temporal. It's only enjoyable for a moment and under circumstances or only with having or only on the, under certain circumstances or only with having certain possessions. It's a word that has been so flagrantly and flippantly used that I know we struggle with trying to understand God's love for us and what he expects our love for each other to look like as a result of his love. And this struggle is evidenced, and we've, we've referenced this many times over the uh, uh, recent years, but this struggle is evidenced by what we saw in the last two elections and the presidencies that followed. The struggle to understand God's love is evidenced even by the lack of compassion that we've seen play out over the uh, uh, last couple of years as we've dealt with the COVID pandemic. And we're not talking about the world. We're talking about a lack of love and compassion among those who say they love Jesus. But Jesus said what? They will know you. The world will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. So how do we display a love we don't understand? As I read through this very familiar text on uh, 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 God's love, I felt more and more like the man Jesus was having the conversation with here in John 3.16. If you're familiar with the text, you know that he was having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. As I was reading through this text, trying to wrap my mind around how God loves me, I felt disconnected. I felt puzzled. I felt small. I felt like the words I was reading left me with more questions than answers. 
I knew that there was a difference in the love that I was reading about and the love, quote unquote, that we see displayed throughout our lives, especially the the love that we've seen displayed in recent years. Nicodemus knew there was a difference between himself and the Sanhedrin and uh, 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 what he was seeing in this Jesus. But rather than leaning to his own understanding and rather than going back to his camp for answers, Nicodemus went to the source. If we look at John chapter 3 in verse 1, we see these words. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. One pastor shares the following about his kids while they were reading through John 3. Our kids have been working on learning the verses we will read tonight. This past week, Daniel was trying to say them to Kayla and got John 3.16 a little mixed up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only forgotten son. He goes on to say that's an easy mistake for a four-year-old. But do we make the same mistake? There's no verse more familiar, but I think sometimes we forget how important it is. I pray this morning that God would give us fresh eyes to see John 3.16 and a deeper understanding of his love, not just for us, but again, what he expects our love for each other to look like because of his love for us. I want to challenge us with three questions. And I say challenge because as I, again, man, I struggle with this one. so I can't say answer. I want to challenge us. I'm challenging myself with three questions this morning. Where should we look to define love? What did God do because of love? And how should we respond to love? Where should we look to define love? What did God do because of love? How should we respond to love? John 3, 16. Maybe you can even just... You just know it. You don't even have to look at it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Addressing the first question, where should we look to define love, really depends on what kind of love we're talking about, right? John Piper shares the following from the Desiring God podcast. He says, so let's admit that there are different kinds of love. Or to put it another way, the word love can be used in many different ways. Whenever we ask what love is, in a sense, I need to respond and say, according to whose definition. He goes on to say, for example, C.S. Lewis in The Four Loves distinguishes eros, a kind of romantic love where the lovers are hungry for each other. In philos. Friendship love, where two people are linked arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with a common vision and a common goal and a delight and a partnership pulling together towards the goal. And storge, affection that one might have for an old sweater or uh, uh, slippers, an old dog that you just can't let go of. For us, it's Zoe. We got a new puppy some time ago, back in August. I love Zoe. Divine love, agape, characterized by sacrifice in the pursuit of another's good. Now, you probably guess from the definitions and the text that we're dealing with that we'll be looking towards the last word, agape. Agape here is a noun. In its verb form, the word is agapeo. It's Strong's number 25, and it means to love or to wish well, to take pleasure in or long for. It denotes love of, uh, excuse me, it denotes a love of reason or esteem. MacArthur writes, agapeo expresses the purest, noblest form of love, which is volitionally driven. 
not motivated by superficial appearance, emotional attraction, or sentimental relationship. Another theologian shares agapeo uh, uh, does not note affection or romantic attachment. It rather denotes a caring, deliberate attitude of mind that concerns itself with the well-being of the one being loved. Listen, self-devotion, not self-satisfaction, is its dominant trait. Bible scholar and author Kenneth Woost, and I hope I got that name right, shares that agapeo speaks of the love which is awakened by a sense of value in an object which causes one to prize it. It springs from an apprehension of the preciousness of an object. It is a love of self-esteem, excuse me, a love of esteem and approbation. Hear this, the quality of this love is determined by the character of the one who loves. So now that we have a better sense of the kind of love that we're talking about, let's look at the one performing the action. It says, for God so loved the world, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What do we know about God? We know that God is good. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him, Nahum 1 and 7. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way, Psalm 25 and 8. We know that God is holy. There is none, excuse me, none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God, 1 Samuel 2 and 2. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy, Leviticus 11 and 44. We know that God is righteous. And there is none other, excuse me, no other besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me, Isaiah 44, 45, 21, excuse me. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, Psalm 145 and 8. He is faithful in all his works and kind in all his, faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Most importantly, our God is consistent. Malachi 3 and 6 says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Jeremiah 31 and 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. Now this is a different kind of love than what we're used to experiencing on a day-to-day basis. You can love that chicken sandwich. Everybody remember the chicken sandwich wars? Popeye's was my favorite. But after everything kind of fizzled out, Popeye's changed some things, didn't they? And you can love that chicken sandwich, but when they make it smaller, how do you feel about it? You can love that chicken sandwich, but when they change the bread, how do you feel about it? My wife's like, he would be talking about food. We're talking about love. I love food. (laughs) Different kind of love, amen? You can love that car. But when that car continuously breaks down and, 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 and causes one too many costly repairs, how do you feel about it? I put $3,000 into uh, 06 Saturn View because I loved it. Still couldn't get it working. Changed how I felt about it. You can love that dog. I love Zoe. But you come home to the right or wrong thing being chewed up right? You come home to one too many uh, uh, odorous uh, perfume gifts, it may change how you feel about it. You can love your spouse when they're doing and saying all the right things, but what happens when they do or say the wrong thing? Can it change at least for a moment how you feel about them? You see, we see a difference, right? Our love tends to be based on pleasant circumstances. And our love can change when those, when those circumstances, excuse me, are not so pleasant. But God's love is different. God's love isn't based on how he feels about us. And it's not based on how we behave towards him. Romans 5 and 8 tells us, 
uh, excuse me, but God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet contrary to him, while we were yet enemies of God, Christ died for us. Even in John 3, we see these words in verses 19 and 20, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Sinners, lovers of darkness, workers of evil, doers of wickedness, haters of light. And yet God, who is good, who is holy, righteous and merciful, kind and unchanging, has deliberately and eternally set his affections on us. It's a different kind of love. So what did God do because of love? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Remember agapeo, the love, uh, the, the form of love that is a verb, the love that is an action. He gave, and not only did he give, excuse me, he gave, and not only did he give, he initiated, Right? The burden of reconciliation wasn't on God. The burden of making it right wasn't on God. If we look back in Genesis after he created everything he created, he looked back over it and said, behold, it is very good, right? So when we get to Genesis 3, it wasn't God who fell. It was man that fell. But like the father of the prodigal son, God runs to us. Not to condemn us, but to restore us. And I want us to catch the oddity of this love. Again, it's so contrary to what we're used to. It's so left field from what we're used to. What's the state of humanity at this point when, 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 when love arrives? Again, verse 19 tells us the light has come into the world. People love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. What's your reaction when someone crosses you? If you came home and warmly greeted your spouse and they completely ignored you, is your first reaction to love in the way that we see God loving here? If you came to church this morning and received a sharp word from a brother or sister, received a sharp word from me, would your first reaction be to love in the way that we see God loving in this text? This isn't even my first reaction in traffic. How many arguments have you been a part of that probably could have been avoided simply because you didn't care for the person's tone? We do or don't do based on how we feel. We make decisions to love or withhold love based on the actions of the person or people that we're dealing with. What if God loved us like that? What if God loved us the way we love one another, based on how he feels? Think about it. What if he decided to give or withhold love based on our actions? Thank God his love is different. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This describes both an expression of God's love and his gift. Excuse me, an expression and the gift of God's love. God's love didn't just feel for the state of a fallen world. God decides, he wills to love a fallen world, to love me and you. And to demonstrate that love, he gave the most precious thing he had to give. He gave his son. And to what end? So that whosoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. God gives gives life for death. Good 
for evil. God saw the ugliness of sin and responded with the beauty of his son. You have to grasp the significance of this, family. We have to grasp the significance of this. Because again, the way that we love each other is so different from the way that God loves us. God who is perfect, God who is holy, God who is righteous, looked on his fallen creation. And rather than responding with the death that we deserve, God took on the very flesh that offended him. Romans 8 and 3 says this. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. When he would have been completely just in judgment, he chose to justify. This is what God did because of his love for us. So how should we respond? How should we respond to this kind of love? Where there are two things, two ways that we should respond to this love. Our first response is faith. We respond in faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now here's the paradox of the unconditional, volitional love that God has willfully set on us. It has to be received right? The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a free gift of God, scripture says, and not of works lest any man should boast, but it is a gift that has to be received. Like the two words early, agape and agapeo, you have this love and then you have the demonstration of that love, the action of that love, excuse me, which is God giving to us the gift of his son. Well, here you have Two words again, pistis and pistio. Okay, you have belief, which is a noun, and then you have pistio being the verb. So that's a demonstration of the faith, a demonstration of what you believe or evidence, if you will, that the gift has been received. What does that look like? How do you show your faith? Well, James says, what? Show me your faith without your works. And he says, what? I'll show you my faith by my works, right? Because faith without works is dead. So what does that look like? It brings us to our second response. Our second response is to love. It's to love the way that God loves us. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 12, the word of the Lord says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Hear this. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's God's word. It's God's word. John 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also ought to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my, dis- you are my disciples, excuse me, if you have love one for another. Last text, 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us And we ought to also lay down our lives for the brothers. We demonstrate our faith by imitating our Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. God loved us sacrificially. As we close, I want to share a few ways in which we can love each other sacrificially. 1 John 3, 17 through 18 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? We can show God's love out of the treasure he gives to us. The treasure that he gives us to be stewards over. 
And we've certainly seen that generosity from you guys uh, played out with the angel tree that we've had this year and years past. And we thank God for your hearts to participate in that. But we want to encourage not just for the Christmas season, but just make that a part of your regular rhythm. Being generous. Amen. To look for opportunities to show the love of God through giving. Pray for Brother Jonathan and myself on that. Lastly, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, another familiar passage. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Verse 8, love never fails. This list is more of a heart check for us this morning. As you look at your relationships, as you look at the people that you interact with, be it strangers on your job, in your home, or the people that you may gather with during this uh, uh, Christmas season, are you being patient? Are you being kind? Are we scorekeeping or are we extending grace? Are we looking to cover others in their imperfections and shortcomings as God covered us? Are we looking for the worst in others or, and, and are we hoping, excuse me, or are we hoping to encourage them towards their best? Is our love for the people around us as enduring as God's love for us is? It's a hardship. Do an honest assessment. Amen? And in moments where we fail, because we, we will, in moments where we find that we are struggling to love people in this way, may we remember to look to God who is love. And because God is love, he gets to define love. Let us remember that he defined love by putting his love on display through sending his son to be the propitiation for our sins. May we remember that he, being completely righteous, initiated reconciliation with those who wronged him. May we remember that he chose to cover faults rather than point them out. That he loved in such a way that he made friends of his enemies. By his grace, may we go and do likewise. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you.